So why do you think we have succumbed to harming our own reflection? A lack of self-love. Mm. <clears throat> you know? Um, and you can't have a self of you can't have a sense of self-love if, if you really don't accept yourself. Mm. And in order to accept yourself, you got to ask some higher questions. Right. You know, you really have to do that shadow work. You really got to, and that work is something that you continue for the rest of your life too. You always have to take that honest exploration of, hmm, why did I feel like that when they said this? Hmm, let me think more about that. Why did I get mad when this person did this? Or why did I... I genuinely not feel happy about that or you really got to explore those type of responses to phenomena that happens in your life right you know and see where you know when did you feel like that you know um when was the earliest time that you felt like that you know all self-harm that we see comes from a lack of self-love and in order to love ourselves, we really have to explore who we are. And when I say who we are, I'm talking about the different layers of who we are. You know, our consciousness or our intangible intelligence, which is conducted through the brain, has been shaped since our childhood. Right. And we really have to think about, like, why do I feel this way about my father? Or why do I feel this way about my mother? Some of us don't ask those questions. And those feelings are ideas that were imprinted in certain situations or scenarios through our growth and development. In other words, we've made promises before that we don't realize we've made based upon certain experiences that we've had growing up. And we still hold fast to certain promises even to this day when we may be in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or 60s. But it might have been something that happened to us when we were six years old and we inwardly told ourselves, I'm going to never let that happen again. Mm -hmm. Or I'm never going to share something. I'm never going to share my feelings again. And we've had difficulty doing that because we set a certain trajectory in our life that we've never changed or someone's never come into our life to actually challenge those ideas or those thoughts right. to help us go on a different trajectory. We've just been on that same path, you know, you know, a, a girl turned us down in first grade and we got problem with girls for the next 25 years mm -hmm. because we got rejected. Right. That's real. So now, you know, so now it's like we never put ourselves in a position where we can even possibly be told no, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so I remember on one of your lives, you stated, a queen never leaves her throne. Can uh -huh. you found on that statement? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, just real quick before I forget my train of thought. And what's uh -huh. meant by reflection, meaning like in relation to man, interaction between the female and the male, or it could be the same sex relationship, but just within the black community, why do people have a desire to want to harm my fellow sister or brother? Because before mm -hmm. anything, we're sisters and brothers to one another, right? So that's what mm -hmm. I meant in terms of reflection, just in case nobody, pe some people were missing yeah. the ideal concept of what I was trying to say. But gotcha. continue. Yeah. So, you know, to add on to that, I would say, you know, that self-love, how you treat and have respect for yourself is how you're going to interact with and treat other people. So because I care for myself and I just don't eat any old type of thing, I'm not going to be okay with just giving somebody any old thing. Because mm -hmm. I respect them the same way that I respect me. You know, I honor respect my time. And I'm going to do that with other people as well. So people on the outside is really an indicator of what's going on on the inside. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In terms of that that reflection that you're talking about. Right. Um, so now in regards to queen doesn't leave her throne, it's like queen has become a very cosmetic 
commercial, casual title that a lot of people use and throw around. Right. And they don't talk about a queen in the context of certain protocols, certain procedures, and principles. And we think about a queen in terms of a throne. I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about a throne in terms of a physical seat that a woman sits upon, but I'm talking about her position, mm -hmm. not only within her own life, but also her position within her family and in her community. There's certain things when a woman recognizes her divinity that she doesn't participate in because it's literally beneath her. And to participate in a certain type of activities, even when you study, you know, you have people that talk about queens, this, queens, that, and they don't study the aristocracy in any kind of society, mm -hmm. whether I'm talking about in China, whether I'm talking about in Europe, or any kind of society. Because when you study the aristocracy and you study these societies, you start to learn about the protocols and the procedures and the principles that governs that throne, that governs that position. So even in this society, we don't have kings or queens in America, but one thing that you may oftentimes hear is about the office of the presidency. Right. The office that the president, as well as the first lady, actually inhabit it's the office it's the exact same mentality when it comes to the concept of a throne it's not just about you personally but it's about your respect and your honor for that position and what is it, what is expected of you because when you look at a society that aristocracy or that kingdom or queendom people depend upon for their livelihood and there are certain type of qualities that are necessary in order for you to maintain that type of position in making sure that the quality of life of all of the people that you come in contact with is something that is improving and something that they have respect for. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so when I say a queen doesn't leave her throne, I'm talking about, you know, for example, um, look at a woman like uh, Felicia Rashad, for example. I like using her as an example. <laughs> Everybody, but every male likes using her. <laughs> I get Someone it, I like get her. It. You know? Um, who else? Um, I mean, there's a lot of women that have a lot of the qualities that, that explains what I'm talking about in terms of not leaving her throne. Um, I've never seen her out of character. And if she was, it might have been in private. Mm -hmm. But her sense of decorum, etiquette, wisdom, you know, all of those various different qualities you can see expressed in how she naturally is as a person. Right. You know, um, Eartha Kitt, another one. Um, Nina Simone, mm -hmm. another one. You can look at all of these various different women and see some of those different qualities which represents the throne. Right? And if you study them, you can see how they've been able to live a life and a quality of life that is not undermined, that others honor and respect, that allows them to secure provisions and protection. You know, one thing I said earlier in this live is one thing I learned from my mother about power is she had the ability to move shit and to make shit happen with a few well-chosen words and a glance. Right. You know, and women naturally learn this as mothers because of that parent-child dynamic. 
and you can look at your child a certain way and check them or say a few well-chosen words and get certain things done. But a lot of women don't evolve to the point where they're able to utilize that same power in the world. And there are many women who have learned to do that. You know, um, I'm going to share this with you. So when I was in college, one of my brothers that I went to college with, his mother is a woman named Barbara O. And Barbara O, those of you who are familiar with the film uh, Daughters of the Dust, mm -hmm. she was in that film. She was the uh, woman in that film who was more fair-skinned. Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> She's an actor by trade. She's a writer, director. She's, she's worked in that industry. And I had a chance to meet her and be around her. Yo. <clears throat> There's only a few women that I've met in my life that I don't know what it was about her, but she had a certain magic about her that made me physiologically respond like and it wasn't sexual at all mm -hmm. it was it was it was my first experience of what will be called uh, sensuality mm -hmm. it was a high frequency of it, it was like it's even to this day, it's hard to describe. And this was over 25 years ago. Mm. Still to this day, it's hard to describe how I felt being in her presence. And she, and, and here's the thing. She knew she had that power. Mm. And it's the same type of power that, you know, like a Felicia Rashad would have. Um, the same type of power that um, uh, what's the uh, what's her name that was uh married to um, Jason Momoa. She's she was uh on the Cosby Show as well. Oh, Denise. Is it Denise? Yeah, yeah. What's 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 her uh, name? Oh, now I know you. What's her name, guys? <clears throat> Dang, I know who you're talking about. Oh, gosh. I just know her as Denise. Lisa, Lisa Bonet. Lisa Bonet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, We're like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, Lisa Bonet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. she, has that, she has that kind of a power, that kind of power, too. Erica Badu has, has some of it, but I question it because um, <laughs> she... She's too public with it. Okay. Solange has that power too. The women that have that power, they're not really public with it, but you can see that it's there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's it's very. Mm. <laughs> it's, yeah, I've mentioned Eartha Kit. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like, you know, you've, you've heard the phrase before, those who know don't tell and those who tell don't know. That's what I'm talking about, you know, um, <clears throat> but it's, it's, um, it's an ability that me seeing it and experiencing it and knowing women that have it, it's like, <clears throat> you have no choice but to honor it, mm -hmm. you know, and men that just objectify women and don't honor women as beings and respect their autonomy. Yup, Lena Horne. Yup, yup. Uh, that don't respect their autonomy are men that have never really experienced that before. You know, it's like when, I mean, anytime you look at any, any of our classical civilizations and societies, even today, when you go into societies where Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Dark damage, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. When you go into societies and you see 
our societies that are matrilineal or you see where we have clan mothers and women who we consult with for various different aspects of life. That is what I'm talking about. You know, we've lost that and it's not being taught in this kind of society that we live in. Mm-hmm. And, and part of it is because of a man's jealousy of that woman's ability. <clears throat> you know, it's like even when you look at it in a Christian context, a woman was made into a holy ghost. You know, you took the child, you know, it was man, woman, and child, but you took the woman completely out of the equation to just the father, the son, and now you got a holy ghost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's no woman anymore. You know, a lot of that is <clears throat> is um is self hatred. You know, it's it's a lot of uh males that really don't respect and honor women. And you know, a lot of us who are older. Mm-hmm. I don't really have a lot of confidence in us getting it one day. It's possible. You know, a lot of us, that's my age, that's almost 50. A lot of us have lived the half of our life not knowing any of this. Mm -hmm. And to set a different trajectory and to be open and receptive to learning something new and changing our ways. And a lot of us ain't going to do it. You know, the best hope that we have is, is striving to raise these young boys with a sense of emotional intelligence and, and showing the flaws and the things that we've been taught about ourselves and about women. Exactly. You know? Uh, that's, you know, to me, that's what really has to take place in order for us to really see a change in the future. Right. <clears throat> you know? Because a lot of us is lost. Mm-hmm. And it ain't no getting us back. <clears throat> so, no. I, just to tie everything together, and if people have questions, place them in the question, the symbol with the circle with the question mark. You can put your questions there because I know people had a couple of questions. If we have time, if he has time, um, we can answer them. But the individual and interwoven ideas. Ideas of how protection, provision, and proximity work together. A lot of us need to get out of the way mm-hmm. and quit being obstructionists. And if you're going to help women, genuinely help and assist women without expecting anything in return, without it being transactional, and realizing that that is a part of what we need to do and what we've always done as a people to support our women. And a part of getting out of the way is that shadow work. We really got to confront a lot of the things that's going on within us and destructure our egos that we have about who we think we are and our identity and all of this other stuff. It's a lot of bullshit that we are as males and as men in this society. And until we're able to really confront that and to get out of the damn way, then we're going to keep obstructing the path that women are going to continue to be on in terms of their growth and development. And we're going to continuously see this big uh, disconnection between us, you know? 